I have only one question before we begin. I'm not sure that we really need to mention the question of the electric phones or telephones. Mm -hmm. No, I don't think so. This is sterling. Now, far from the light and well mannered. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, what a pleasure it is to see such a country tuneless plethora of the populace of this fair city gathered here under the vast ceiling of these magnificent Albert Halls as we invite you to join us on a journey around the world in 80 days, an adventure in words and music in 10 chapters, scurrilously plagiarized, or if you wish, freely adapted, from the famous novel by Monsieur Jules Verne. And now, time passes. Chapter 1, in which Phineas Fogg makes a wager he seems unlikely to win. From London to Suez, via Monsigny and Brindisi by rail and steamboats, seven days. From Suez to Bombay by steamer, 13 days. From Bombay to Calcutta by rail, three days. From Calcutta to Hong Kong by steamer, 13 days. From Hong Kong to Yokohama by steamer, six days. From Yokohama to San Francisco by steamer, 22 days. From San Francisco to New York by rail, seven days. And from New York to London by steamer and rail, nine days. Total, 80 days. Yes, 80 days. That does not allow for bad weather, contrary winds, for shipwrecks, for railway accidents, and so on. Nonetheless, I will bet 20,000 pounds against anyone who wishes that I will make this tour of the world in 80 days, or less, in 112,500 seconds. Nineteen hundred and twenty hours. The train leaves for Dover at a quarter before nine. I shall take it this very evening.
survey in Egypt from the comfort of their ship on the Suez Canal. A succession of sharp whistles announced the arrival of the Mongolia. The porters and fellers rushed down the quay and a dozen boats pushed off from the shore to go and meet the steamer. Soon her gigantic hull appeared passing along between the banks and eleven o'clock struck as she anchored. She brought an unusual number of passengers, some of whom remained on deck to scan the picturesque panorama of the town, while the greater part disembarked in boats and landed on the quay.
fog crosses British India by train and elephant and gains a second travelling companion. Passepartout, on waking and looking out, could not believe that he was actually crossing India on a railway train. The locomotive, guided by an English engineer and fed with English coal, threw out its smoke upon cotton, coffee, nutmeg, clove and pepper plantations, while the steam curled in spirals around groups of palm trees. I can do it 
different from Judah. You are a man of heart, this is a problem. Sometimes, when I have the time for it. <laughs>
halt at seven o'clock. The guide made the young woman drink a little brandy and water, but the drowsiness which stupefied Aouda could not yet be shaken off. But he was not disturbed at the prospect of her future fate. He told Fogg that she would inevitably fall again into the hands of her executioners. These fanatics were scattered throughout the country and would, despite the English police, recover their victim at Madras, Bombay, or Calcutta. She would only be safe by leaving India for help. Phileas Fogg replied that he would reflect.
our party crosses the Pacific and Aouda's feelings for her protector grow. There was a full complement of passengers on board, among them English, many Americans, and several East Indian officers who were spending their vacation in making a tour of the world. Nothing of moment happened on the voyage, and the Pacific almost justified its name. Fog was as calm and taciturn as ever. His young Indian companion, however, felt herself more and more attached to him by other ties than gratitude. <laughs>
minutes past seven, and the next does not arrive till ten minutes after twelve. Well, gentlemen, if Phileas Fogg had come in the 723 train, he would have got here by now. We can, therefore, regard the bet as won. Wait! Don't let us be too hasty. You know that Mr. Fogg is very eccentric. His punctuality is well known. He never arrives too soon or too late. And I should not be surprised if he appeared before us at the last minute. <laughs> Then there was a moment of silence. The great saloon was perfectly quiet. But the murmurs of a crowd outside were heard with now and then a shrill cry. The pendulum beat the seconds. Sixteen minutes to nine! One minute more and the wager would be won. They counted the seconds. The 40th second, nothing. At the 50th, nothing. At the 55th, a loud cry was heard in the street, followed by applause, hurrahs, and some fierce growls. And at the 57th second, the door of the saloon opened, and the pendulum had not beat the 60th second.